so good morning, good afternoon. Welcome in across the continent, everybody. My name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And if you're joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And frankly, you could not be joining us on a better day because today is World Oceans Day, June 8th, every single year. We have spent the last seven years, our entire existence, celebrating this week with a slew of incredible broadcasts of scientists and explorers around the world. This year's no exception. We've got 21 programs with amazing people, I think on four or five continents. It has been a wild ride. We're on our home stretch. Tomorrow we're wrapping up with three more. We've only got one more after this today. But I'm particularly excited for our audience because today links together basically all of my favorite things in oceans. And I, you know, I get the chance to hang out with some really cool people and talk about some really cool topics all the time. I pinch myself daily. But today combines a lot of the coolest stuff. I worked at an aquarium for several years, so we are hanging out with the Seattle Aquarium team. We are talking about ROVs, remotely operated vehicles underwater, robots that you get to do with video games to explore cool habitats around the world. It is, if there's a cooler topic than that, I don't know what it is. And we are exploring kelp forests. We get to feature divers all around the globe and pretty much universally when they say their favorite place to dive on planet Earth, it is the west coast of North America. The kelp forests there are a really special and unique ecosystem. And so today, we're going to go hang out with Zachary Randall to talk to us about the Seattle Aquarium work using ROVs to explore kelp forests. I'm super excited. I hope you are as well. Without further ado, Zachary, thanks for joining us for the first time, man. Nice to have you on the broadcast. Jesse, hello. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm excited to talk with you and your audience today about ROVs and kelp forests. Um, yeah, so folks, hello. Um, my name is Zachary Randell. I'm a research scientist at the Seattle Aquarium. And I want to ask a very simple question to you all, and that is, have you ever thought about what it would be like to explore the sea surface, the, the bottom of the sea, that is, with a robot? And, and that is actually what we do on a daily basis here. And believe it or not, we use an Xbox game controller to drive this robot nice. all along the seafloor, collecting video imagery and collecting data to better understand the health of coastal ecosystems. And to give you just a quick sense about my background and, and uh, my path to this job, I'll let you know that uh, I spent years as a scientific scuba diver. So you, you all may be familiar with scuba diving, strapping a, a, a tank of compressed gas onto your back and breathing off it. It's literally life support equipment, similar to what astronauts in space have to have if they do a spacewalk. Well, we use life support equipment to go underwater and we do all sorts of work. We collect data um, such as this diver actually recording what they see underwater on an underwater slate with underwater paper and, an, and a pencil. We install equipment. We, we collect various types of data. I, I even conducted an experiment underwater as part of uh, my grad school experience. So this is all broadly under the umbrella of, of what we'd call a subtitle technician. So sub underwater or beneath, beneath just like submarine, beneath the tide. So it's another way to think about um, underwater. Subtitle technician, so, so someone that works underwater. So I was a scientific subtitle technician. Okay, why are we working in kelp forests? Uh, why do we care about kelp? What is kelp? Um, I don't know if you all have had exposure to kelp or not, but it, it's a form of marine, so ocean vegetation. It's very similar to, to plants, but it's underwater. Instead of growing in dirt and soil on land, kelp attaches to hard substrate, so bare rock, and it sticks. It's, it holds on really tight to the seafloor and resists the, the surge and the current and the movement of the ocean, and it grows. And it has these beautiful blades, uh, similar to leaves on a tree. And they have photosynthetic structures. So they harvest energy from the sun, just like a plant. And just like plants uh, on land, these kelp forests form these dense forests underwater. And just like terrestrial forests or, or land forests, there's different layers. So whereas you may find grass, and bushes and trees in your backyard in a forest, 
underwater, we find small layers of, of algae. So we find red and green algae and then kind of medium-sized algae, what we call understory, because it's a layer underneath the main canopy. And then there's some kelp species, very few, but some that grow really tall and actually reach the sea surface. And they form this three-dimensional structure. You can see it in the background here and you can see it zoomed in here. Um, it's just these beautiful, beautiful three-dimensional habitat that's super important to support life for invertebrates, kelp, and the, 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 the indirect effects of kelp also affect marine mammals such as sea otters and orcas. So the, these kelp forests have deep significance to indigenous communities as well as the broader coastal community for tourism, recreation, scuba diving, kayaking, fishing, and, and the aesthetic, the, the visual beauty of these ecosystems. So just to give you another sense here, this is these are some photos from some um, diving work I did in California. Um, I spent a good chunk of my time in graduate school understanding what the, the, the factors that are in some cases imperiling kelp forests or, or challenging kelp forests. So for example, we're seeing some climate change related events where kelp can actually get wiped out. So it can be removed. And in some cases, an urchin barren forms. So sea urchins are, are this invertebrate species, very spiky, you may have seen them before. They can actually switch their behavior. They go from being passive and kind of tucked away and not really bothering the kelp to all of a sudden roaming all over the seafloor and grazing and eating all the kelp. They actually form fronts or, or big groups, just a big group of sea urchins that will wander all over the place and you can see here they're eating kelp. The, these are the actual bite marks as the sea urchins have, have just been chowing down. And you can see there's a kelp plant. You can barely see it, but it's getting swarmed right here. And there's another one right here. And what can actually happen here is if the sea, uh, sea urchins do this enough, they can prevent kelp from recovering. So it actually becomes an alternative state of the ecosystem. The ecosystem switches from being a healthy kelp forest to an urchin barren. So we want to try to better understand kelp forests. We want to understand what causes these shifts, what prevents them, and what can help enable kelp to be healthy and productive long term. Now, everything that we can possibly do with the ocean in terms of us interacting with it are our conservation measures. So do we try to use a giant underwater vacuum to suck up all the sea urchins? This actually, this actually happened in, in Northern California. Do we smash the sea urchins to try to recover kelp? Do we put out baby spores to grow new kelp? Um, do we try to recover pinto abalone in endangered species? Do we, do we regulate fisheries? Do we regulate how much fish we take out of the ocean? All these conservation management and restoration decisions require data. They require information. We have to have a basic idea of what's going on along the seafloor, what's the health of the species, how many individuals are down there, where are they, what are the trends over time. It all requires data and information. The core objective of the work I'm leading right now is to try to expand our ability to gather data. So for example, remotely operated vehicles have been around for a while. They're typically large vehicles. You may have even seen a stream from one of these earlier. Um, and they're often deployed off large vessels way out at sea. And it's only been in the past five years or so that remotely operated vehicles have gotten small enough and maneuverable enough that we can actually deploy them in kelp forests. Thus far, ROVs haven't really been in kelp forests. It's mostly been scuba divers, but scuba divers can only cover so much area because we're limited by how much gas we have to breathe. So an ROV can go much further than a scuba diver. It can cover much more area. So it's a really exciting new tool to bring into these important kelp forest ecosystems. So this is ROV Nereo. This is one, one of our two ROVs. Um, as you can see, it's very small. Uh, we've customized it. Here it is with Megan Williams, a research technician that, that works with me on this project. Um, you can see Nereo here underwater. We have 
multiple lights that light up the seafloor so we can gather nice, well-illuminated, well-lit video imagery. Um, we, we indeed drive it with an Xbox game controller, which when you think about it makes sense. The, the thrusters are tuned precisely for the exact type of motion that the ROV exhibits underwater. Um, and you can see here, this is how we interface with the ROV on the surface. You can see our laptop. You can actually see the ROV looking at me with its built-in camera right here on the screen. Um, yes, so, and lastly, I just wanna quickly note that we're using artificial intelligence methods of image analysis. So you may have heard about AI um, before. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't, that's okay. But we're using some of these new exciting tools to analyze our imagery and extract data off of them. Um, if you want to learn more about our work, we're trying to make it as open source as possible so anyone can learn. If you scan or take a screenshot or take a picture of this slide, this, this QR code will take you to a web page and we have tons of video available. We list out all the hardware we're using. It's all out in the public domain so folks such as yourselves can, can learn about it. And, and indeed, there are some other groups that are wanting to customize an ROV just like ours. So we're, we're trying to grow a family of groups that are able to use relatively low cost open source hardware to develop ROV programs to go out and survey kelp forests. OK, so with that, I'm going to switch gears a bit. I just quick shout out to our funders. I am now going to. Oh, what? Yeah. Okay, good. So this is showing. So I'm going to show you some videos now. I'll walk you through a couple of videos. Yeah. So on the left, this is the forward facing view from the ROV. And on the right, this is the downward facing camera. And the two videos are synchronized together. So they're, they're seeing the same thing. Uh, and so you can see here all this brown. This is baby bull kelp. So this is bull kelp that will eventually grow and reach the sea surface. And you can see the blades of it. You can see, though, we're passing over it right now. All these blades have the photosynthetic structures. That's how the, the sunlight energy is harvested. You also see some red algae. You see red algae, green algae, and other forms of algae. This is like the grass or the moss, the, the kind of low layers or, or close to the ground layers, just like you see in a forest on land. So I'll let this play just a little more to give you a sense of it. And note here, there's lots of rocks and hard substrate. As I mentioned, kelp needs to grow on hard substrate. Got a nice little perch here. Okay, I'm going to pull open a couple more videos to share with you all. Um, so this, this was a harbor seal friend that we encountered. This was the first time we saw a marine mammal underwater with the ROV. And so this was out in the San Juan Islands. And as you can see, he's just kind of hanging out. He's not too bothered by the ROV at all. Just kind of lounging on the seafloor, holding his breath checking us out. Notice the, the kelp plant right to his right that's even bigger than the harbor seal. There's some very large kelp species. This is a single large blade underwater, and you can see some more of those. He slides off to the bottom. Let's see, I will show you another one. So something that is limiting um, kelp in Elliott Bay near Seattle is kelp crabs. They eat kelp, kelp crabs. They're an herbivore similar to sea urchins. And so the, the wire structure, this kind of ropes that you're seeing, that's bull kelp. And all these small things, these are tons of kelp crabs that are basically swarming all this kelp. There's even a kelp crab on the ROV's tether, the line connecting the ROV to the sea surface. And what you see here, you see these kind of bare structures in the water there should be lots of blades attached to those, but they're all gone. They've all been eaten by the kelp crabs. 
So one of the objectives of our work is to better understand how species like kelp crabs, why nothing is eating them and helping to keep uh, the ecosystem balance in check. Okay, let me show, I have, a, ah, here's another good one. So now this is the forward facing view of the ROV. All this brown material that you see, this is another type of understory algae. So it's kelp that doesn't reach the sea surface, but you can see it kind of spirals. It has a little bit of a curly Q appearance. And you'll notice the water isn't as clear as it as you might have seen in, say, a, a coral reef or a tropical area. There's lots of particulates in the water, and you can really see that here because it's sunny. Um, in kelp forest, visibility is often a little more limited because there's so much nutrients in the water that there's all sorts of microorganisms like plankton and teeny little algae phytoplankton, zooplankton, which eat the, the phytoplankton. Um, so often visibility can be quite limited. In this case, the water is reasonably clear for the day. And, and so we're able to capture some good imagery. We skip ahead just a little bit. Yeah, this, this is one of my favorite videos because the, the little particulates in the water kind of give it a little sparkle. And then you have the bull kelp, these big strands, and there's more of those kelp crabs. They're just everywhere. Uh, you have reproductive structures from the kelp that's visible here. Now, you may wonder, how are we able to run the ROV into this canopy forming kelp without getting the tether, the, the line connecting the ROV to the surface entangled? The only way we're able to do it is because the ROV is so small and maneuverable. You can see us right now maneuvering uh, in between the, the stipes or the stems or the tree trunks of, of the kelp plants. So because the ROV is small and super maneuverable, we can get into and out of kelp forests. And it's, we're hoping it will change the way we collect data in this ecosystem. So there's many different ways to get involved with marine research. You can approach it from a conservation angle. You can approach it from um, species restoration, trying to recover species. There's field work. There's coding, more analytical tasks. Um, uh, I'll show you. I'll show you another video that's an example of some of the video editing that we do to clean up these videos. And here, here we're navigating through a pretty dense kelp forest. We're having to very carefully maneuver the ROV through all of this. Just very slowly, very gradually. Okay, so let me pull, I'm finishing up here. Let me just show you a couple more things. I'll take your time, man, this is great. Okay. So this, this is a pretty short example of how the video looks originally on the left, and then we color correct it. So we, we just play with it in a, in a computer program that, that cleans it up. And on the right, that's pretty much exactly what it looks like. And so we're able to, to do this single color correction to, to help clean up our imagery. Let's see here. Uh, here's a fun one. Um, so a little bit of background. Back in the 70s, folks thought it'd be a good idea to lash together, so tie together a bunch of tires to form a reef and then chuck it in the ocean to provide habitat for fish. They were well-intentioned, but it's not super great because we now know that tires have compounds in them that are not great for the health of certain species. Um, so we were diving the ROV, flying the ROV on just one of those tire reefs, and you can see a uh, encounter that we had. So you might see a little friend here. Can you can try to guess what that is? And I'll give you a hint. It's an octopus. Um, and it lived in this tire reef along with many species of fish. So this, this is a neat encounter that we recorded and I'll kind of tell you what's going on. So we're just following it very, very gradually right now.
and you'll see a fish dart out from where the octopus, there it goes. So there's, there's actually many, many fish that live in these tire reefs. So you can see the ROV moving around a bit. I'm having to fight current, so water movement, um, while filming this. So that's, I'm using the Xbox controller to try to stay in one position and get imagery of this octopus. And you can see it now changing color, changing its camouflage to blend in better with all the barnacles that are on this tire reef. And so now this, this is a super cool encounter. It's kind of hard to see because a bunch of sediment was kicked up but the octopus is right here. And I want you to keep your eye on it. It is exhibiting what we call mimicry. So that's when the octopus takes on a new form or shape to try to imitate something else. And to the best of our knowledge, it's imitating some sort of crab or large snail. And it's basically trying to say, look at me, I'm, I'm not an octopus, pay no attention. And what ends up happening is that a crab over here has something to say about this new large crab or snail creature coming into his territory. And again, it's a little hard to see, so you'll, you'll forgive me for the lower quality video, but we got the octopus right here walking on its arms across the seafloor. And I know it kind of jumps around, sorry. And now the crab actually comes out and charges the octopus to, to you know, try to get him away from his territory. So super cool little encounter that we just happened to record. So I think with that, I think we're roughly at the amount of time I was supposed to talk. So I will <laughs> turn it over to you all um, and answer any questions. Oh, that was fantastic, Zachary. Thank you so, so much, man. Uh, we've got a bunch of groups joining us across Ontario, Nova Scotia, Alberta, and more. So a big thank you to our audience today. What a cool exploration of the kelp forest. Uh, and by the way, historically, it's always been a metaphor that it's like playing video games. You're the first person to ever actually have an Xbox controller, which is just astounding. So all those skills that I gained in thousands and thousands yeah. of hours of Halo are, right. are coming to you. So if you ever wanted me to fly out there, I could like play like a pro. Um, we got a question from online. Uh, if there's a most surprising thing you've ever found, so you've been going along with the ROV, you see something that is just shocking. Is there a standout moment for you in your explorations? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think probably one of the most surprising things I've seen, and I, I touched on it in my talk, is is how much these ecosystems can change over, over relatively short periods. You can have a vibrant kelp forest and then you can come back next year or six months later and it can look totally different. Um, and in our case, we've seen that with the formation of urchin barrens. And then we've seen, we've seen the urchin barrens removed for one reason or another, and then the kelp can recover. So it's just, it's, it's almost like if you were out walking in a forest yeah. And you come back six months later and now it's a desert, right? You just be like, what, what on earth is going on here? Um, so I, I think those, those dramatic shifts uh, are, are very surprising. And, and one thing I'll add is just that it, the seafloor, it's like exploring an alien planet. Some of the life that we encounter and the, the kelp, the invertebr invertebrates, the fish, bizarre forms of life that you only encounter underwater. I, I don't know of any um, sponges, say, that are that are on land and perhaps not even in freshwater. So there's many species only found in the ocean, and it's it's a pleasure to be able to to explore them. Absolutely. On the species note, we got a question online about sharks, which of course are a big topic of interest to all our classrooms around the world. Do you find sharks when you're doing this? What kind of sharks do you find? How big? Yeah. What's the deal? <laughs> So we haven't seen any sharks with the ROV, unfortunately. Um, the sharks tend to be fairly wary, at least in the areas we're working. And so they'd likely avoid contact with us in the ROV. Um, there's, there's many more species of sharks in warmer waters, tropical waters. And, and so I'm afraid I, I don't have any exciting shark encounters to tell you. Um, from the ROV. I'm sure we'll have more marine mammal encounters, harbor seals, um, sea lions perhaps, but but no sharks yet, I'm afraid. Okay. 
Um, on the kelp note, when I used to work at Ripley's Aquarium, we had fake kelp because it grows so quickly. Can you speak to a little bit about how fast kelp grows and if that changes how you have to navigate through these environments yeah. with the ROV? Yep, yep, absolutely. So kelp grows incredibly fast when the right nutrients are present. Um, it, kelp requires cold water, so cold, nutrient-rich water. And when you combine those conditions with the, the long summer days, such as we're starting to have now in warm, warm, sunny weather, um, it can cause the kelp to grow very fast. Certain species can grow even so fast as several feet a day. Um, so the, the species of kelp that reach the sea surface, some of them grow, hit the sea surface and keep growing. Yeah. So there can be just as much um, plant material or biomass up on the sea surface as there is throughout the rest of the water column. Super cool. Several feet a day is hard to fathom. I mean, it's only kelp and bamboo in the world that I think meet that threshold. And that is, it's really weird to think of something growing the length of your arm in a day. It yep. seems uncanny that that's even possible. You can just sit there and eat popcorn and watch it happen. Uh, very, very cool ecosystem. Our 6C crew, Aylesbury Public School, thanks for coming in. Apologies for the link mix up there, but you're in. And if you want to unmute your mic and share a question. Hi. <laughs> hey, folks. Uh, do you have any questions for Zachary about the kelp forest? Anything you might have seen anywhere on YouTube? All right. right. We're going to have okay. Samira come up first. Hi, Samira. All right, we're gonna have Samira come up first. Hello. Um, why aren't the animals scared of the ROV? That's a great question. The tr answer is I don't think we necessarily know because we they don't tell us. But my guess would be it doesn't really look like anything that they've seen before. And so they're probably not afraid of it. And they're more wondering, what, what is that? Uh, it, and so oftentimes the, the fish just kind of look up at us, pass by. And the harbor seals are super curious. And they're just kind of like, what, what is that thing? But we don't approach them in a threatening manner. We don't, you know drive towards them super fast or anything. So yeah, they, they seem just mostly curious. Yeah, I love that you answered it this way because we just wrapped up a broadcast where the question was very similar about ROVs in the water. And they were like, we don't know why animals go to them. It's like, because they're fascinated. I mean, that's, don't, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to invent a new behavior. Just like we're curious about new things in our environment, so are wildlife. We see this all around the world. The Galapagos is an example. We see a lot with this where people go and the animals will come right up to people because they don't view them in a threatening way. So I'm really glad we got that question. Aylesbury, we are super delayed. And so what I'm going to do is bring you into the broadcast and you can just ask a question the moment you see yourselves on camera. But on mute too. <laughs> Um, how many types of kelp, uh, kelp, kelp, kelp are there? Are there? Yeah, great question, guys. Great, great question. So in the Washington area, there's about 22 species of kelp. And in the Puget Sound area, there are, I believe, 16 species of kelp. Um, there's a few more worldwide that are found. Um, and what there's many, many, many more species of are different types of algae. Yeah. So kelp is just one type of an algae, just like big trees with tree trunks and, and annual leaves that grow and fall. That's just one type of, of plant. But there's also red algae and green algae and just like we have bushes and grass. So there's many, many, many species of algae in the world. Yeah. Great question, guys, and the students keep coming up. So I will come back to Aylesbury in just a second as well. We've got a great question online because we've been getting this a lot during Ocean's Week. It's been interesting to see how kids have started asking this. How much do the ROVs cost? What's the <laughs> funding needed for this? That's a great question. That's a big part of how we're able to do this work. So all together, including an acoustic GPS tracking system. So we use sound waves to track the position of the ROV underwater which is super important to enable our work to be standardized and repeatable. So with that fancy tracking system, the ROV and the laptop computer to drive it, everything, it's about $25,000. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of money and it is, 
but five years ago, a similar ROV would be say $150,000 and it might not even necessarily do as much. So the, the field is changing very rapidly. The prices are coming down and more people are able to, to obtain these um, ROV vehicles. And so that, that's what's partially what's enabling us to, to do the work we're doing today. I was going to say, when you said 25K, I would have thought much, much more. So that's good to hear. We just wrapped up with the Nautilus crew and their ROVs are extremely high tech, 10,000 feet down, have to be specially made. But they mentioned off the shelf ROVs, which is such a wild concept to someone who grew up as a kid where there was like two machines in the world that could do anything like this. Yeah. So yeah. it's like the golden age of ocean exploration, which is so, so exciting. I'm glad we got that question. Thanks, guys. Um, Aylesbury, I'm coming back to you. And I want to note too, every time I get the chance to have a class from Brampton, I live in Newfoundland now. I miss Brampton. You guys have the best Indian food in the world and we don't have that here and it's really, really sad. Uh, but 6C, come on in, take us away. <laughs> hey. Um, I have a question. Okay. What do the controllers on the Xbox controller do? Great question. So the, the thumb thrusters that move a character in a video game move the ROV forward, reverse. We have a lateral side to side movement. We have yaw or kind of um, changing the angle, the direction that the ROV is facing. And we can also move up and down. So that's your thumb thrusters. And then other controls, the D-pad, for example, turns up the lights that face downward. And the, the D-pad up and down controls the speed, or what we call the gain, how fast the ROV moves. Um, we can also, with the, I forget what, not, not the main triggers, but the, the other kind of secondary triggers up top, yeah. they put the ROV camera up and down. Cool. And, and then the, the Y, A, X, and B, enable different modes. So for example, there's a depth stabilization mode. So wherever I have the ROV in the water column, I, I click that mode and the ROV will automatically hover. And probably my favorite part about the ROV is how sophisticated the software is that governs the ROV's movement in the water. So with the depth hold mode, we can just stay right there. We don't have to touch anything. And it's, it's thrusting very slightly every which way to keep the ROV perfectly still. And that level of control helps us um, get in and out of kelp forests easily. And the last thing I'll say is that we also have buttons. We don't typically have this attached to the ROV, but we do have it. We have a grabber arm, which can open and close and grab something. And we haven't really used it for research yet, but we have it and we've used it on the ROV and it's lots of fun and you control it with the- control. Get out there, use it for research. I, like 16 year old me is like, you're combining my two greatest passions in the world. So uh, what a cool story. Thank you so much for that question, guys. Um, from YouTube, um, actually similar to one of our questions that's coming in in the chat now, um, the animals that you find generally, you highlighted quite a few of them. Um, we'll, we'll take this, how do they survive in the kelp forest? And our Aylesbury crew wants to know, do the, how do they get oxygen or how do they have oxygen where they are? Yeah, that's a great question. So these, these animals in the ocean, they, they have um, evolved over time to survive in the oceans. And, and they have um, structures, there's many different types of structures that are similar to our lungs. We breathe in gas and, and we filter out and absorb the, the oxygen and exhale CO2, carbon dioxide. Well, the, the animals underwater do something similar. So fish have gills and they pass water over the gills and there's little structures which take out the oxygen and then the fish exhale, exhale, breathe out just like we do. Um, some species of sea stars have little structures all along their the top of their body that's doing the exact same thing. Their, their lungs, their version of lungs is all on the outside, um, very different to our anatomy, but it, it swaps oxygen for CO2. So there's lots of oxygen in, in the ocean, um, just like there is in the gas that we breathe and, and different species have different ways of accessing that oxygen. That's a beautiful way of answering that question. You're a great educator, man. Um, let's head to Aylesbury again. Ms. Reed, class, feel free to chime in. We'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, but Aylesbury, come on back in. Hey.
um, when was your first time with the R with the ROV? When was your first time when you like took it down in the water and controlled it? Uh, cool question. Great question. So it, it it was fairly recently. I think it was the end of 2021. I was just finishing grad school. And so all my previous experience working as a subtitle technician grad school, I hadn't actually worked with ROVs before. I'm brand new to it, um, but but I'm able to learn learn as I go. So it, it's only in the past couple of years that I've gotten involved with ROVs. I started scuba diving when I was younger, when I was 15. I grew up in Alaska and started scuba diving up there. And that just got me hooked on ocean and exploring the ocean. And it's, yeah, I've been doing marine related things since then. By the way, the way you said subtitle technician so quickly, it made me think subtitle technician, like a YouTube editor, which is not what you did. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, by the way, for our students today, we've got some grade six classes in, and you mentioned starting scuba diving at 15. I did my first dive at 27. When you are eight, you can do the Patty Bubble Maker course on the path of being a scuba diver, and when you're 10, you can get open water, which is what I have. So at 10 years old, you can start on the path to exploring 70% of the world that you otherwise have no access to, which is like black magic, as Zachary will tell you, like scuba dive is one of the coolest things you'll ever get the chance to do. And you can learn whether you're in Ontario, whether you're in Saskatchewan or Iowa, if you're in the middle of a continent, there are scuba dive training opportunities for you and I really can't encourage that enough. I'm gonna head to YouTube for one question from there and then we're gonna go back to Aylesbury for one final one. We got a bunch of classes, which is great. Um, time flies and you're having fun though, so we're nearing the end of the broadcast. Gershon wants to know in Miss Khan's class, how does kelp spread across the ocean? How does it take over these wow. whole habitats? <laughs> That's a great question. So I, I mentioned that kelp is similar to plants, and this also goes for how kelp uh, reproduces and spreads. So plants release pollen, right? They release spores and pollen into the air, and it travels on the wind. And sometimes we breathe it in and get stuffy and have reactions to it. Well, kelp releases something similar. Kelp release what we call spores. And it releases millions, if not billions of spores into the water column, just like the pollen goes into the air. And many, many, perhaps most of these spores won't turn into kelp, but some will. And it floats through the water column and settles down onto the seafloor, and there it waits. And, and for species that grow once a year and are removed and then grow again, um, those spores will stay on the seafloor over the winter. So it, it just hangs out on the seafloor and you know the crabs are walking by, the fish are hanging out and it just kind of stays tucked away. And when the light starts getting longer, as the days warm up and get longer in the, in the spring, it starts to grow just, just like a plant on land. And, and by the summer, if everything has gone well, you'll have a nice, large um, kelp individual. Very, very cool. Uh, marine spawning events are one of my favorite things in the world and how they sort of take over. Coral particularly, coral spawning is like fireworks underwater. It's like the coolest thing in the whole world ever. Um, so I encourage our classes, check that out when you're done the broadcast. And if you can, make it to an ocean because seeing these things in person beats any virtual program ever, even though this is pretty cool. Uh, Zachary, we're going to wrap up in a minute. I do want to note for our classes, seattleaquarium.org. If you look up ROVs there, you'll see like tons of pictures of Zachary looking really cool out by a harbor with the ROV, uh, having the absolute time of his life. Uh, but we're going to head back to Aylesbury for one final question live. Uh, a huge thanks to all our classes live on YouTube and beyond. It's been a real pleasure having you. But wrap us up with one final question, guys. A huge thanks to all our classes live on YouTube and beyond. It's been a real pleasure having you. But wrap us up with one final question, guys. A huge How long did it take you to make an ROV? That's a great question. How long did it take? So Blue Robotics is the company that we got our ROV from. Anyone can can look them up. Blue Robotics. Um, and it comes in a kit, almost exactly like how Legos come, come in a set. And there's some instructions and, and you build it and you put it together. We assembled our ROV kit into a fully functional ROV in about two days. And so that's that's all it took. It was a very careful process. And we actually have video online that anyone can access at that QR code that, that takes you of um, us assembling the ROV and it coming to life. Zachary, it took me two days to do my IKEA TV cabinet. So <laughs> I'm very impressed with your technical skill, man. Um, I know classes, we could chat all day. I would encourage you like, 
keep tuning in with us. We're going to be doing a whole bunch of Zachary next school year as well. I know we're wrapping up our school year, which is kind of sad and exciting at the same time. SeattleAquarium.org, BlueRobotics.com to follow up more on that. And uh, I hope you'll all join us for our Oceans Week celebrations. We've got 21 broadcasts. They're all on our YouTube channel to check them out there. Uh, but Zachary, what we do to wrap up the broadcast, I'm going to bring in our classes to say thank you and farewell. YouTube groups, you can yell at home as well. But Aylesbury, thank you so much for being here. Ms. Reed's class, thank you so much for being here. And have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. Bye for now, guys. Thank you so much.